I'll begin with a short passage from Dogen's Genjo Koan. Firewood becomes ash. Ash cannot turn back into firewood again. However, we should not view ash as after and firewood as before. We should know that firewood dwells in the Dharma position of firewood and it has its own before and after. Although there is before and after, past and future are cut off. Ash stays at the position of ash and it has its own before and after. As firewood never becomes firewood again after it is burned and becomes ash, after a person dies, there is no return to living. However, in Buddha Dharma, it is a never changing tradition, not to say that life becomes death. Therefore, we call it no birth. It is the laid down way of Buddha's turning the Dharma wheel, not to say that death becomes life. Therefore, we call it no death. Life is a position at one time. Death is also a position at one time. For instance, this is like winter and spring. We don't think that winter becomes spring, and we don't say that spring becomes summer. So Dogen starts off stating our usual way of thinking things. If firewood becomes ash. But then he examines this from a perspective of impermanence. and ends up deconstructing our ordinary sense of what a thing is, what change is, what time is. If each so-called thing has no unchanging essence, We cannot say that it goes through a sequence of time or transformations. There's no ongoing thing to say is changing or developing or progressing. Each thing is just each moment of what it is in that moment. When firewood is firewood, that's all it is. It's not a step towards ash. It has its complete existence as firewood. And ash isn't a transmission, transformation of firewood. Ash is ash. It has a complete existence of before and after, just as ash. And then he extends that to birth and death, saying, if there is no permanent self, we can't say that something has come into existence. And if there's no ongoing thing, we can't say that it is at one point ended, call that death. It's beginning and its end is happening all the time, moment after moment. This kind of 
focus on impermanence not just disrupts our sense of time, our sense of becoming. But for Dogen, it dissolves the boundaries between one thing and everything else. Again, if their things have no fixed inner essence, how do you describe the difference or the boundary between one thing and another? In another passage, Dogen asks us to carefully examine the phenomena of mountains walking. He says we're all familiar with human beings walking, but we ought to understand mountains walking as well. What does that mean? Well, at a very literal kind of level, you could say that for there to be walking, you have to be walking on the ground. That the ground that you walk on the ground that is the earth that makes up the mountains is a just as a necessary part of walking as are your legs. Can be no walking without their walking on ground. And walking is an activity that both you and the ground partake of or co-create moment after moment. But we wouldn't have to really restrict it to the mountains as the ground on which we, we walk. He could equally have said, the trees are walking. Because again, our walking can only take place, only make sense in terms of walking in a world. Nothing is taking place in a vacuum, in isolation. The world in which we walk is a world of ground and sky and water, trees, sunshine, Our walking is something that happens only in this boundless context in which everything requires and determines and defines everything else. None of these things exist separately or independently. Everything implies every other thing. Heidegger has a, an analogous idea, and I realize I'm probably in trouble if I think I'm gonna make anything simpler by making reference to Heidegger. But he talks about the fourfold disclosure of everything. And he gives an example, a water jug. And he says, there are four dimensions to this water jug, the human, the divine, the earth and the sky. The human is the way when we see this jug, we immediately recognize it for what it is. We see it as a vessel, a container. We see that it has a handle that we can grasp. We see that it is a size and shape and weight that's graspable by us. We understand it as a usable artifact. It's not a inert thing it's immediately perceived as 
something that we can make use of as part of our life. The divine we might translate as the realm of meaning. The jug is not simply a physical object that can contain wine or water or milk. It has a place in a whole form of life. And that place, that sense of its place is not simply its utility, but all the ways it signifies is signifies the life of which it's a part. Is it something very rough and simple that goes along with the life of a, a peasant? Is it something for everyday use? Or is it something that's kept up on a shelf for display and taken down only on special occasions? Does it signify our daily meal or do, is it used in a holiday ritual? Does it signify poverty or wealth or something in between? The jug, when it sits in its position, immediately discloses this whole world, this whole form of life around it. It's not simply an isolated object, but we immediately recognize it as part of a whole array of things like plates and knives and glasses. The jug itself is part of and signifies a whole world the same way as walking in mountains do. And he goes on to say it also has a dimension that he calls earth because the jug it's made of clay, for instance. It conveys something about the whole material world and its possibilities. Clay can be something rough and very simply crafted. But clay can also be turned into the finest, most delicate Wedgwood porcelain. Or it can be made into a precious Japanese teacup for the tea ceremony. Just the materiality of clay contains within it all these possibilities of what else it could be. It's not simply, it's one manifestation, but it sort of sends out echoes of all its possible manifestations, and uses and forms in the world. And the final dimension of sky implies the whole universe of existence and forces that make such a thing as clay in a jug and fashioning possible. It's its materiality, its elemental properties, the fact that it has weight, the fact that there is gravity that gives things weight This is sort of the whole background 
of the, the forces that go together to make the world what it is. The whole history, the geology of clay that makes it something that's formed in a way that we can mine it and use it. So again, what I hear in this kind of fourfold disclosure in Heidegger to me feels like an analogy to what Dogen is trying to say in terms of the walking of mountains. Everything interpenetrates. Nothing has a clear boundary. Everything implies the whole world in which it's found. So we've got these two very different kinds of dimensions to each thing. On one hand, everything is completely unique in itself. The firewood is just firewood. The ash is just ash. Everything just has this unique momentary existence as itself. And at the same time, everything implies every other thing. Nothing has a separate, unique existence. Everything comes at us whole. Now, all this may seem to be very abstract and metaphysical. But I think Dogen is trying to, as was Heidegger, to free us from a kind of false narrative of uh, continuity, a false narrative of a certain kind of story of progress. I think that we take these narratives so for granted that it's very hard to even imagine thinking about our lives in any other terms except how are we doing? Where are we getting to? Where have we come from? How did we get here? Is it going well? Is it going badly? See, we take all these different moments in our life and we not only string them together, we string them together in a way that we think gives them meaning. But that meaning can be very arbitrary in ways that we are oblivious to so that we forget that the way we've put those moments together uh, is something of our own creation. It's not intrinsic in the moments themselves. Some of you uh, may have seen a little video not long ago of uh, Mel Weitzman, the teacher at the Berkeley uh, Zen Center, who just passed away, uh, I believe he was about 90 or 91 years old. And in the last months of his life, uh, they made a video of him giving beginner's instruction. And it was very charming uh, to see him teach Zazen and to demonstrate how to sit. And he showed all the different postures, including how to sit in full lotus. It's quite remarkable to see this 90 year old man sitting in full lotus. And it's very nice to make a narrative about how a lifetime of practice 
develops into that ease and capacity, that physical strength and resilience and flexibility that makes all that possible. I think it's a wonderful story. I wish it was mine, <laughs> but it's not. Maybe 30, 35 years ago, I could sit most of the time in half lotus. Never was able to sit any length of time in full lotus. But when in those years when I could sit most of a session in, in half lotus, I imagined that the more I did this, the more I would become flexible and gradually I would be able to do this uh, well into my old age. And it would keep me flexible and limber to be practicing like this. Well, just the opposite happened. My knees got stiffer. My ankles and toes have become arthritic. And now not only is it very, it's not really possible for me to sit cross-legged at all. And the pain in my feet has in this last year made it uh, harder to even sit uh, kneeling in Seiza. And now I sit most of the time in a chair. What kind of narrative is that? Has this practice failed me? Did it work for Mel and didn't work for me? See, I think that my practice now has to be fully occupying the position of sitting in a chair. It's not that sitting in a chair is a failure to sit in half lotus. Sitting in a chair is sitting in a chair. The same way that being 71 is not a failure to have remained uh, 35 or 40. Now I find myself 71 sitting in a chair. And I fully occupy that position. That's what Dogen is asking us. When we find ourselves in the position of ash, can we be fully ash? Or are we going to always try to remember what it was like to be firewood in the good old days, right? How many of these kinds of narratives do you impose upon yourself? How much do you compare the age you are now with the age you once were? How much do you scare yourself with the age that you're going to be someday in the future? How much do you create a narrative of progress or failure? Do I have the job I dreamed of 20 years ago? Do I have the partner? Do I have the health or looks or wealth? Do I have the children or family or children that I think I'm supposed to be able to have now? All those things, we can, we can have a wonderful list of those. And they can be like Mel's being able to be in full lotus at, uh, at 90. It'd be great to be able to do that. But what if you can't? Is your life a failure? How do you fully occupy the position you actually find yourself in without endless comparison? without judgment, without a whole story about why it's this way instead of some other way. 
Dogen and Heidegger are using this very abstract way of talking. But each in their own way, they're asking us simply to come back to life manifesting just as it is right here and now. And to allow ourselves to fully be that. The narratives are always possible and will always be there. In some aspects of our daily life, we need the narratives. But Zazen is designed to give us an alternative to that. That there's a whole dimension to our life that is not defined by those kinds of linear narratives not defined by comparison and judgments. When we talk about just sitting, we really mean stepping off that linear narrative train into the moment of just this. Can you do that today? <laughs> 